Thanks everyone for joining us today on Dance Demo Day. Uh, we have really great talks um, to, to hear. Um, we are going to try to be strict a little bit with, with the time. So let's try to aim for five to seven when you are about like six minutes. I'm gonna give you a warning and then it's gonna be a hard stop at seven. Uh, so then we can get time for questions and then like uh, chat uh, at the end of the day. Um, as I said, today we have really great talks. The first talk line up had a long title and I'm not sure I'm gonna pronounce all the words right, but um, it's analyzing terabytes of ocean simulations model output with X-ray, X-GCM and X-histogram uh, that Tom is gonna be talking about. So I will give you the floor, Tom, and then you can get started. Hi. Um, so I want to talk about something that I've um, been working on in, uh, I've been working on for quite a while now in Ryan Abernathy's group at Columbia University as part of the Pangeo project. Um, and this is something that I talked about before at SciPy. Um, and also ended up writing a blog post about but the context is is that we basically i'm going to show my screen but I'm, the context is that we basically have a massive ocean an unprecedentedly large ocean simulation that we want to analyze um and the the simulation is so high resolution that the entire data set is five petabytes. Um, but we're not even trying to, to do the whole problem yet. We're just trying to analyze the surface currents of the ocean. And we essentially want to take, we want to calculate some simple vector calculus quantities over the surface. So basically turning velocities into like divergence, for example. And then we do that for a few other quantities and then histogram them all together. So the analysis is relatively simple. You're, you're basically mapping like a U-funk over the whole domain. And then after you've done that a couple of times, you're doing a, a multidimensional histogram, binning everything against one another. But because we we're trying to analyze so much data, then every part of this needed to be rewritten in some way in order to make any progress. So we essentially, we start from open it by opening this data that's posted in the Pangeo cloud. Um, this is from, the, what's, the simulation is called LLC 4320. Um, and we open up all that data and here, this is what what this is what the data set looks like for only one twenty fourth of it. We have it at hourly time resolution, which for the ocean is very high resolution. Um, sorry, folks, can you mute yourself? Uh, BBP. Uh, there we go. Thank you. Sorry, Tom, about that. No worries. Um, and we have. There, there's a complicated domain, um, which also required a lot of work to keep track of, but I won't talk about it too much here. But the upshot is that we have these quite large arrays. Um, in this case, I'm just showing you a fraction of the problem for this demo, um, but this is velocity over the entire ocean and um, subsampled at the surface, it's still 340 gigabytes. So, we use this library called, we, we want to calculate things like vorticity. Um, so this is my function to calculate vorticity. And this uses a library called XGCM, um, which is something that we wrote. And XGCM essentially generalizes operations like X-rays apply UFUNC to understand staggered grid variables. So whether or not your variables lie on cell centers or cell edges, we can encode that information and we end up with a function that we've decorated to become aware of the positions of variables before and afterwards. But ultimately, from a DASC point of view, it's calling X-ray apply UFUNC, which calls DASC apply GUFUNC. Um, once we define all those operations, we have um, 
vorticity, strain, and divergence. We put them all into a data set, and this is our lazily computed output data set of um, vorticity, strain, divergence, and the Coriolis frequency, which we need for normalization. Then the other interesting thing about this calculation is that we are doing it on a per region basis because doing a histogram of the quantity we're interested in over the entire ocean would only give us one histogram that globally aggregated everything, which wouldn't be very useful. We want a regional breakup. So we do some stacking stuff with X-ray, add some indexes, and eventually we get something like this. And this is using hollow views to get a map of each region. So we've taken the global ocean, which we have data for everywhere, um, down to like a kilometers resolution, which is very high resolution. And then we're going to calculate our histogram separately on every single one of these regions, all in one go is the idea. The task graph for calculating just one vector calculus quantity in one region would look something like this, where you've got a bunch of open data set calls. The um, dealing with the staggered grid business requires some like padding operation here. Um, and then the histogram step goes through X histogram, which we rewrote uh, to use Dask blockwise because histograms are ultimately a blockwise style calculation because the histograms of two sets of data, the hit, they're kind of commutative or whatever the word, correct word is. They <laughs> do histograms the same as the histogram of two subsets. So you can take a part, you can take, you, you can use that to express a, hist a histogram as a blockwise operation, which is why you go from this like wide part of the graph here, and then it gets sort of amalgamated downwards. But we have thousands of these like separate chains side by side, uh, and the scale is causing us problems. Um, so the last step is to coarsen, and then eventually we have an output graph that gets more complicated. I want to see. I started this running. I wonder if it's going. Uh, yeah. So this is currently running, and this is running on a local cluster, um, and this is a subset of the full problem we want to do. I still haven't successfully run the entire problem, but even this did not work two years ago at all, and it's now very nice that this does work. And what's particularly good about this is that it's effectively streaming relatively well so one minute the, sure so the basic structure of our problem is we have an extremely wide task graph where the chains are roughly independent from one another which in an ideal world we would stream each of those regions on the map and calculate them totally independently but previously uh, the distributed scheduler didn't behave in an optimal streaming fashion. And that led to running out of memory in this case, but also in like quite a lot of other Pangeo use cases. Um, by working with Gabe of Coiled, Gabe Joseph of Coiled, we were able to get the algorithm in distributed to be more intelligent, to understand how to stream some essentially changing the heuristics so that it was more able to stream certain uh, workloads, including this one. And the result is now that I'm able to analyze like this problem of scientific relevance at large scale. And this is just, this is with local cluster. So essentially like my cluster is a lot smaller than my total problem, um, but we're able to just stream through the task graph effectively working through this very wide task graph, like left to right in sort of the intuitive sense that we might, that a human might want to when looking at such a graph. Um, and we are at time. Okay. So we might, if we got room at the end, maybe we can, we can look back in. Uh, no, that's it. That's what I wanted to share. Thanks. Awesome. Uh, it was very exciting to see so many colors in the in the task stream, uh, and then that things are are moving and progressing. Um, up next, we have Hendrik, uh, who's going to tell us a little bit more about the new um, shuffling implementation, new ish P two P in Dask. Um, so, Hendrik, take the floor. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, today, I want to talk to you about P two P shuffling or uh, to talk about the problem that it uh, solves um, shuffling large data in the DAS at constant memory. Um, 
So we have a blog post out about this. Um, I also have all this code in a GitHub repo. I'll add this to the uh, GitHub issue uh, issue later. Um, you now to get every... the left, like the notebook part uh, bigger, maybe close in the, the sidebar on the left. And I can also zoom in. Is this better? Yeah, so men will be a little bit bigger. Oh, sure. I think that's better. Thank you. Okay, perfect. Um, so first to get everybody on the same page, um, what is shuffling? Uh, why do we need it? Um, why is it important? Um, shuffling in essence is pretty key primitive in data processing systems. Um, it's used basically whenever we want to move a data set around a cluster in some all to all fashion. So with data framework loads, that's for example, joins, that's sorting with arrays, that's more or less rechunking. And what we want to do in shuffling is essentially we have some data set with some input partitions. Um, we want to repartition those, for example, because we want to group by, by customer. And here you can see inputs have multiple customers in this. After shuffling, every customer has its own partition or shares some partition with all this data from the same customers in the same partition. That is essentially what we want to do. Um, why has this been a problem? Um, let me just show you this. Let's take a cluster that I've already set up here. It has 71 gigabytes of data. And now I'm just going to create some data set of this same size. And I will run a shuffling workload on this. And we'll see it over here soon. There we go. And what you can see now with this workload is that memory over here keeps increasing over time. Um, we also have a lot of white space in here and data movement. So um, we're not really use, utilizing the underlying hardware that well because uh, CPU is idling for some time and waiting for uh, data to get moved around. And eventually we get to the point where this starts spilling in probably a couple of seconds because DAS so far has materialized the entire data set in memory, which is a pretty bad idea as, as soon as you get to like very large uh, data sets because then we have to spill this, this is fairly inefficient and um, eventually might also just kill your cluster and will definitely kill your performance. Um, now to solve this, what we've done is we've added a new implementation of a shuffling uh, algorithm in Dask and with uh, the release in, um, in February, we have actually made this the default shuffling methods for distributed clusters. And what this does is that instead of blowing up all your memory here, it will handle this much nicer, handle this in a more optimized fashion and just use constant memory. So let me show you how this works. I'll just restart this cluster real quick get this out the way, and then we can see a side-by-side -side comparison of task-based shuffling and P2P shuffling. Now, if we compare this, what you'll see is that here, memory will remain roughly the same, um, roughly constant. Here, basically same thing keeps increasing. What you can also see is um, the difference in white space between the tasks. So we're uh, utilizing the underlying hardware much more efficiently. If I let this run for a bit, which I can do, um, it, what we'll also see is that this thing here will be much faster because the implementation takes a lot of hardware optimizations into account already. And um, that just helps us shuffle data sets more efficiently and with smaller uh, clusters.
Now, for everybody who wants to dive a bit deeper into how this works, um, let me just give you a rough overview. Uh, this is a two-stage algorithm. So the first stage, what we do is take all the data, push it out, um, and sort it, and then send it to all the target workers. Then we have a second phase where we read everything back in from disk. We have this explained in a bit more detail in the uh, blog post that I mentioned up here. So I recommend you just uh, read this if you're more interested in, in the details. Um, what we also have here is a dashboard that you can use if you use P2P shuffling. This lets you see um, the performance of the system and how the individual components are being utilized. So we can see uh, what data we're writing over network and over uh, from and to disk. We can see how we're utilizing the network bandwidth that we have between workers. Or in this case, because we're reading data from disk right now, we can see um, how much um, throughput we gain there. One minute warning. And now what we've seen is this thing is done. This thing is still busy and having a lot of white space. So let me abort this and give you just a very small preview for the area folks, because as I said, Array workloads of this are similar to data frame shuffling, not exactly the same, but what we've done is we've taken this data frame focus implementation and generalized it to arrays. And what we can see, what we do here is basically we take some, yes, I would say geospatial workload where we have a lot of uh, a three-dimensional data set that is chunked by one dimension and we re-chunk this by, by a different dimension. And what we'll see here is that this right now, because it's naive implementation, seems stuck for a brief moment because it has a lot of overhead in the beginning, but now it starts working. And we see the same pattern as before. This here increases in terms of memory use. This will start spilling soon, whereas this remains constant. And in summary, hopefully um, this helps you with your shuffling workloads, with your uh, rechunking workloads. Um, on DOS data frame, it is the default right now. Um, we have a discussion issue for this uh, where you can leave feedback. If this is working for you, if this is not working for you, um, if you are working with arrays, uh, this is right now an experimental implementation. You have to set some configuration values that are also in this notebook over here. Um, and please try you it out. Can this is not read how it works. All of this in the blogs. We are at time. Thank you, Hendrik. I just Thanks. drop in the chat like the discussion issue. So please, folks, if you have uh uh, workflows like this and you you want to try them then uh, give it a try and then comment there do we have any questions Our time for one question yeah uh, this is this is really neat so is this um, exploratory right now do you have like somewhat of a, a draft that people could sort of check out and and test or like be beta testers for this because um, it seems really awesome and especially with a lot of like Pangeo related workflows um, it's be good to, to test out. Um, so you're talking about arrays right now, right? Um, so just for context, once again, like for data frames, this is already the default. So if you have the latest release, people will already be using this, um, even if they might not have noticed. Um, for arrays, so more so like the array. Um, yeah, for arrays, um, it is in the latest release. Um, I recommend you probably, if you want to test this, install from uh, from GitHub main just to keep the latest uh, improvements in there. Um, but you essentially just have to set two configuration values, one of which is just selecting this explicitly. Um, you have to also disable low level optimization, sub one low level optimization. Um, and we will leave an issue on the Pangeo um, discourse as well for people to uh, check this out, to comment on this. 
Awesome. And then, well, with that, uh, Max, you're next on queue. So if you want to take the floor, Max is going to talk to us about scaling weather radar uh, data analysis with Dusk. All right. Uh, so let's go ahead and get started here. So, uh, yeah, I wanted to take some time today. It's not going to really dig into the weeds too much. Um, basically, just talk about our use case in the weather radar community. Um, so, yeah, so a lot of the times we use this this package called, called PyArt um, to be able to do this. Uh, so the, the core data that we work with, this example of the, the radar data we're working with today, it's from Crested Butte, Colorado. We play these radars all over the world. Um, and so the, the core data here are CF radial, which is a specific type of net CDF. Um, that stores this data in its radial coordinates, basically degrees around the radar and, and um, basically how far above the ground. Um, so yeah, so a lot of the times we, we use uh, PyArt, so we load into this radar object, uh, sort of the, the core arrays and that sort of thing we use within this radar object. It's essentially a dictionary of, of NumPy arrays. Um, right now, which you can see reflected here, you can see the NumPy master array uh, with some of the information. Um, under the hood, we use a lot of Cython, um, especially uh, with some of the, the gridding code and some of the, the data cleaning code. Um, and gridding to a Cartesian grid is typically the, the first point that people have with, with the radar data, just to be able to get it like a similar thing to models. Um, so yeah, so typically we'll go ahead and grid our data. Um, after we grid it to a common Cartesian grid, we can get this nice X-ray object with the that then we could sort of use with the rest of the, the Pandio stack. Um, and then uh, for this next part, so this workflow, we're sort of interested in uh, looking at snow snowfall and we sp specifically want to grab sort of the lowest value to the ground. So we go ahead and apply uh, this function right here that basically just grabs the lowest elevation. And you can see the center of the radar, this is where the radar is located and the, the deeper blues re uh, represent some of the, the higher snowfall amounts. Um, and so, yeah, so currently with, with PyArt, um, the, the way that we usually scale this, this is just a single file. If we wanted to scale this to an entire, uh, sort of analysis, uh, we, we typically, uh, sort of parallelize at the, the file level. Uh, a lot of our functions and that sort of thing aren't, um, using, uh, that's sort of the, the, the level that we want to parallelize. It's not really using, uh, distributed and, and that side of desk yet. Um, so let's go back down here. Um, so let's go ahead and scale this up. So we spin up the cluster, um, this is already running. So uh, we set up our desk, our uh, desk bag with some set of files. We go ahead and apply this computation, um, basically mapping those different files and applying the analysis. And then we end up back uh, with our output. In this case, we're actually saving it to a file and um, then we can read it back in and analyze and, and look at this um, day's worth of data. So that's how we currently use this with, with Pyrate. Again, mainly parallelizing at the file object um, and essentially doing that for uh, each of the, the radars. Um, but uh, yeah, so here we can see sort of a time series um, across there, we can see all of our different snowfall rates um, across time. And then down here, this is actually accumulating um, across the whole day. Um, so what's exciting is we've started development of um, sort of a shared IO package. It's, it's enabled us to use uh, more of Dask and, and, and uh, really take advantage of um, some of the key benefits. So I'm going to go ahead and run. Uh, awesome. So, uh, yeah, we have this new package X radar, which is, is planned to be sort of the, the shared IO, uh, between sort of the broader radar community outside of just PyArt. Um, and so in a, in a similar sense, we, we go through and, and load in our files. Um, what we've done is written some X-ray backends to be able to deal with this this data model and be able to uh, to store it in these these readout coordinates. Um, so we're able to use the the OpenMF data set here to to load in a collection of files. Uh, which if we go ahead and pull up the the task graph here, we'll give it a second um, to be able to go through and and load a bunch of these in. Um, give that a second. Restart.
Um, so yeah, so what this allows us to do is not just work at the file level then, uh, but actually work at the, the higher level um, collection of files where we can then apply um, different functions. You can see it right in all the files. We're still working on optimizing um, where it's not, you can see here that there's quite a bit of white space in between each of these tasks and be able to chunk these up better and, and um, handle that process a little bit better. Um, so again, this is pretty, pretty early in the development stage. Uh, but what this allows us to do is load it into this, uh, the shared data set, that then we can go through and do our analysis. Um, I'm going to go ahead and run these. You can see here, now we have this X-ray data set uh, that, that we could dig in to see all these snow rate variables. Uh, that we, now we have these, these nice aggregated um, data set where we can, you can look at all of our for chunks and our, our data arrays um, and be able to, to deal with each of these variables is about 25 gigabytes. Um, we wouldn't have been able to deal with um, in the, the core pirate object, but now we can we can deal with nicely um, using X-Radar and the, the X-Ray stack. Um, so then what we're doing is applying some, some geo-referencing, selecting some data. Um, and again, instead of having to, to do this at the individual Render object or the individual file object and sort of apply across things quite a bit easier. Um, so give that a second to, to load. Um, so this next what we're what we're doing is actually working on the core uh, radial data. Um, so we're we're accessing and um, calculating the the total um, snowfall across this. This is a larger data set than the, the previous ones. The, the, the other notebook, we're only using 10 times. This is using 87 times. Um, and this is all on my local machine, um, about 32 gigs of RAM. Um, but yeah, just sort of showing that this is something that wouldn't necessarily have been possible um, with the current reader object. And so, yeah, so you can see it going through and um, applying One minute. The, the calculation, applying some of those functions. Um, yep. Almost done. Um, so yeah, so you can see it going through computing, and then we end up uh, towards the end here. Of course, it decided not to plot. Um, no, just remove the C label. Um, so then we end up at the the end here uh, with a plot of the total snowfall um, from the the lowest level of the radar once that loads in. Uh, which you can see represented there. Um, so yeah, we're really excited about um, developing this package, really excited to look into uh, writing new algorithms and that sort of thing to, to work on this and to continue to take a look at the uh, the desk tech, task graphs and see where we can uh, make things a little bit um, easier to apply some of these different calculations. Um, yeah, at the, this point, that's about it. Uh, I'll go ahead and open up for questions. Awesome, thank you, Max. Do we have any questions for Max? Yeah, Max, this is super cool. Um, I myself am like a computationalist, but I work with a bunch of uh, radar people and uh, I would just will we'll send them this way. I, I think uh, this, this could be of interest to them. Uh, I wanted to ask, um, do you know if, uh, I, if this stuff like works with wind speed measurements as well, or is this like more so focused on precip? Uh, Max, you're muted. Oh, yep. Um, it works with any of the, the the radar variables you're working with. So it could work with velocity data. I know a lot of people work with like radial velocity. Um, so yeah, so it works with that as well. I'll go ahead and link. I, I put together a Git repo with these notebooks. So if anyone wants to try them out, go for it. Um, feel free to ask me if you have any questions. That's awesome. Thank you, Max. Thanks, folks, for the, for the questions. Um, up next, we have uh, David who is going to tell us a little bit more about automatic package synchronization in coil dust clusters. Um, so, David, uh, I will give you the floor, and I will interrupt you if you are close to run out of time. Thanks, Nani. You should be pretty quick. My goal is to finish demoing in three or four minutes, and then maybe zero to three minutes, zero to four minutes for questions. Uh, Hi, I'm David. I'm part of the Coiled engineering team that works on the Coiled platform, rather than uh, like Hendrik, who's part of working on Dask itself. Um, 
I want to talk about a, uh, a common pain point that we see what, with coiled customers, but also everyone else using remote clusters is how do you get the local environment to match what's on the cluster, um, especially in an interactive development workflow. Um, so I'll share my screen and demo an approach to that, which we're trying out. Um, so just to, Natty, we're seeing my screen, right? Yes. Looks good. Um, cool. Just to set the stage a little bit, I have an environment I created with some packages from uh, ContaForge. Could also be PIP packages. Uh, I also have a local package I made with a not super exciting function for getting a greeting. For a, Same a for me. Hi, Natty. Um, Hi. That's just a that's a local package I, I kept installed dash eed with. Um, I think I started it this morning with cookie cutter. Um, that's yeah, editable install. Um, so I want to I want to make a cluster, um, and I want all of this to go to my cluster. So I'll ask Coiled to start a cluster, and you know that. Our older solution to this, I think like a lot of people has been Docker images, right? Um, so we would expect our user to come with a Docker image or we have coiled software environments, which is just a way of more easily building Docker images for you. Um, this is different. So what's happening here? We're, um, we're asking the coiled backend some things about what packages matter. So this is to deal with um, various issues we've run into. Like I'm on a Mac locally, but my cluster is going to be Linux and that asking about which which packages do I really want to have on Linux? Some of the packages on my Mac won't actually, the different architectures mean, mean there's some complications. But then we scan the local environment, figure out what packages there are. Uh, Samantha, um, I should have said I, I didn't do most of the work on this, but the time didn't work great for Samantha who did. Um, Samantha has a blog post about all the different ways Python packages can be installed. And so we're, we're doing many things to figure out what your local environment looks like. Uh, and then here we're creating a wheel for my local package. That wheel is going to end up going to, to S3 and, and then to the cluster. Um, and then Coiled is building a Conda environment that we can then push to the cluster uh, when it's time. So this, this build is happening. The build of the environment is happening in the cloud. Um, now we have our cluster. Uh, Get a client and let's greet Natty again, but this time from the cluster. And we have our, our greeting. Um, so this would work with, um, I think, our the, the engineers at Coiled working on Dask at Dask enjoyed doing this with. Um, you know, Dask as a locally installed package, they can make changes and then quickly get that to the cluster. So they've they've enjoyed that for Dask development ever since we've had this this opportunity. Um, if we take a look at the environment, we can see a little bit about what's going on here. The packages that were built into the environment, the logs from when Coiled built that environment. Um, that's all I want to show. Um, and any questions? We're happy to talk about how this works. Anything else folks are, are interested in? Um, I don't necessarily have a question. question. Yeah. Working, working on getting this to work, work for more complicated dependencies. Maybe Nat can say something about that if he's on the call. Before Nat does, I don't have a question. I do have a, a quick comment as a, as a user of this. Uh, it's been great. I don't have to think about software environments anymore. Like, uh, I used to get the big red scary warning when, you know, doing things with remote clusters, or I had to actually like think about building Docker images and specifying my local environment and making sure that's all like synced up and not, I don't have a stale Docker image anymore when I install something. So just like, thank you, uh, David and team. This has been great. I don't, that is like a whole class of problems I have, haven't thought about in a while. Yeah. There is a question on the chat. Uh, Jacob, do you want to say it aloud or do you want me to read it? I can say it out loud, I don't mind. I, so I, I was playing with the coil and rapids recently and like 
was trying to get this to work and like i know that like rapids is like a hard to package thing right? so i was just curious like how well this behaves with like things like CUDA toolkit rapids pytorch tensorflow like things with like unpleasant c plus plus things or like other things that maybe have like an apt dependency yeah some of that um i i can say um yeah i think the short answer is it depends um so if you're pip installing gdoll that might be painful and not work if you are doing stuff that is easy to conda install that might work um gpus are something that are mixed right now um that we're trying to make work smoother i see samantha is on the call so samantha you want to hop in and then add more context then uh, we still have like a few minutes left from the time of the talk so if folks have more questions um yeah uh, so Specifically, uh, I don't know how, you, how much you know about um, how Conda lets you install GPU packages, but we're not currently setting um, the CUDA virtual package when we install Conda packages. We do with the package sync build. Um, so you'll pull in CPU builds on Conda, um, which is no fun if you're trying to use a GPU. Um, if you use uh, the, the pip landscape has slightly improved in this, but um, if you do things like pip install torch, that'll work. I've, I've actually managed to have uh, okay success with um, using PyTorch uh, with package sync because the, the pip installed version just seems to uh, magically work with CUDA. Um, we do, uh, we, we like mount in the GPUs um, via Docker, uh, NVIDIA Docker. Uh, whenever you use a GPU instance. Um, but at the moment, the thing that's definitely missing is setting that Conda virtual package when we actually do the, the package install. I don't know if so, that helps at all. I'll that's repeat cool. the short answer yeah. and then add to it. Short answer is it depends, but also getting better. Yeah, yeah. I need to, Rapids can be installed with PET now, so I need to play with that on package sync and see how well that works. I'm curious as well how like different architectures play. Like how, how does it work from like a Mac so like Linux hosts with packages like Torch, like are you, was that success with like a Linux system that you pip installed Torch on? Like, cause nope, I assume I'm, Torch I'm do like binary things. Oh, cool. Okay. That's yeah, exciting. Wait, there's a lot of like fuzzing. It is, it is, um, it's not a one-to-one -one copy. We're not looking at the package hash hashes and installing like identical packages. We're looking at your environment, checking what versions you have installed of things and saying, OK, what will install on Linux? Um, and often that means like, oh, the slightly different version will install. Um, that's probably OK. Or like, oh, this is a very critical, like this is message pack. This man, this needs to match exactly. Only install this version, please. Um, well, awesome. all right. That's yeah, about the time that we had like for this lot. If we if you folks have more questions about Pakistan, then we can like just move it at the end. But to be respectful, we have one more talk, uh, which is about graph neural networks training with DASP by, and I'm probably gonna mispronounce your name, but Bibu, uh, please correct me if I'm wrong and take the floor. Hey guys, yeah, uh, you pronounced that perfectly. Let me just try to figure out how to share my screen. Uh, can you guys see my screen? Yes. Yep. And you see a slide which is, uh, yep. Uh, yep. Uh, so cool graph and graph neural networks. So first, I'll give a brief overview on what are GNNs. So GNNs essentially are an optimizable transformation on all attributes of the graph. So any graph in the real world will have some attributes associated with its nodes, edges, or maybe the overall graph itself has some attributes. So you can think of these attributes as a vector of values. So each node will have a vector of values attached to it. Each edge will have a vector of attributes attached to it. And what all GNNs do is apply some sort of a transformation on these attributes and 
then we use that those transformations to do various kind of tasks whether it is weather prediction whether it is predicting whether this molecule will be a, a pungent molecule or not and across it just works across a wide range of problems but to keep it brief you have a graph as an input and a graph as output and all that happens in between is a transformation or operation on the vectors of the attributes associated with each graph and the main component on how these gnns are seen is there's a concept called messing message passing in gnns so as uh, each attribute that is transformed is uh, is transformed based on the values of its neighbors and so essentially in this animation what we are doing is we are calculating <coughs> uh the transformed attributes of node 5 and to get that first you get you, you you do two hops one is first you transform all the neighbors of node 5 and then you, you use those transformations as it is shown in this animation to calculate the newest neighbors to calculate the updated attributes of the node 5 so essentially you do two hops so there are two layers of traversal involved one on the first layer since you first transform all the neighbors of the node that you want to transform and on the second hop you transform that using the new updated transformation of the neighbors so uh, as you can see that uh, as your graph scales, it's not really possible to uh, to do apply transformations on all the neighbors, right? So you need to do some sort of a sampling. And for well, instance, to compute uh, a node five, uh, we can choose which particular or like how many neighbors we want to sample from, rather than sampling all the neighbors. That's all this animation shows. So. Next slide is why do you want to use rapid to accelerate GNN? So currently in GNN training in the world, uh, sampling is a major bottleneck and rapid already has some primitives, scaling it at trillions of edges, but we are still working on developing pipelines to that integrate with open source frameworks like DGL and PyG and actually scale. So a common GNN end-to-end -end workflow will look like you have some parquet data or some data coming from some sort of a database, which is first pre-processed. This is also currently uh, accelerated using Dask ODF primitives. Then you have some, uh, then you have the newest, new updated embeddings for each nodes and edges. And then you create a distributed graph. This graph is actually also created using Dask. And then you have data loaders, whether it's PyG or DGL, which are the leading open source frameworks for graph neural networks. And then you do some sort of modeling and do distributed training. So on pre-processing, we have seen around 10x speed up using a task. But again, the main, I just want to focus on main part. So we have uh, the gene and data loading has two steps. One is neighbor sampling and two is neighbor features. And we kind of have to support a lot of uh, setups. One is single GPU plus single trainer, then multi-node, multi-GPU graph, plus single trainer, plus multiple trainers. And this is where Dask comes in. So I'll just give an example of what a single GPU pipeline looks like, then move on to the Dask enable pipeline. So a single GPU pipeline, you have a cool graph graph which lives on a single GPU. You we wrap that up using a cool graph DGL pack uh, class called cool graph storage, which essentially is a duct type class of the DGL up storage class upstream. And then we use DGL's data loading with neighbor sampling. Uh, but this graph essentially because often this graph won't fit on a single G, single gpu memory or a single node memory so you have to distribute the graph so the graph is also distributed using dask workers so each essentially worker has some pointers to the each dask worker will have will hold one 
portion of the partition graph and uh, then all of them are in uh, are contained in a container called kugraph.multigraph which is connected to the trainer process using a dask client this is where on the most interesting bit starts which is that you can all the even the graph is distributed across workers but you can also have multiple training processes by multiple training processes i mean that you'll have multiple pytorch trainers working on multiple training gpus and you'll have your graph sitting on distributed uh, on uh, different sets of gpus for sampling so One minute warning yeah, yeah. so now uh, we use multiple dask clients currently to support this sort of a setup so each pytorch data loader essentially calls has uh, has essentially a dask client attached to it and that dask client is responsible for calling the sampling algorithm on multiple on a graph that is distributed across multiple workers using dask and this is one setup. Another setup is you can directly also write the samples to disk and then use the KuGraph data loader with uh, for KuGraph DGL data loader. So essentially, rather than communicating the results via uh, one batch at a time, you communicate a bunch of results by first writing them to disk. So yeah, that's the essence of my talk. So just to give some brief context, this has allowed us to scale to uh, about 400 billion, uh, uh, 400 billion edge scale, which was previously not possible. So, and we it. are at time, so perfect timing. I have a question. Uh, is there anywhere like uh, that we could like, see how was this like in action, like any notebooks yep. or any presentations from uh, uh, previous conferences or things like that that you can share with us? Uh, we, I don't have conferences link. There'll be some GTC talks on this topic coming out, but it's all present in the GitHub repo, so I can probably link you guys to that. Yeah, that would be great if you can share us. And then folks that also gig talks, if you want to share the links to your notebooks and um, presentation in the in the dust demo day issue that we had for today that will be great i'm going to drop it in the chat and we do have like around eight more minutes uh for folks if you want to like um ask questions about the other talks or like have comments in general i would also say if folks felt that, oh, this was great, and I would like to talk about what I've been talking uh, or what I've been doing. Uh, there is a, another community issue that I dropped there where you can sign up for the upcoming ones, drop a comment, and then I will just follow up with you. Um, I don't know if it's around here. I know, Martin, you said that you can talk for five minutes about something, so probably I will ping you for the April session. We have folks already for the May, but we still have like plenty room for the April session. So feel free to drop a comment there. I know, Doug, you mentioned something on the community meeting that you might be able to talk about um, things that you've been working with that's awkward. So always feel free to comment in there and you'll be aligned up. Um, Hendrik, I have a question. Um, I'm reading through the blog posts quickly then um it mentions that uh task annotations are used in the p2p shuffle and i was just wondering yeah. what information is attached in the task annotation because this was suggested in the um root task over production problem thing as well that's like something that might help and i was wondering if there was anything in common there um <clears throat> What we're actually doing with the task annotations is more of an implementation detail. So we tell task which uh, shuffle they belong to um, so that they can re request certain information. So this is less about 
for example, restricting resources, but um, just achieving this this mapping essentially, and making okay. this work out of band and in extensions. Fair enough. Thanks. Any more comments? Funny jokes? Uh, got five more minutes. If folks don't have any more comments, we can wrap it here. But then it's great to see so many people uh, talking about Dask or joining us to hear about Dask. So. Um, is there any plug that you want to do for something that you've been working on? I want people to take a look. Feel free to, to jump in. I have a quick plug. Um, uh, Natty every two weeks gives an excellent DAS tutorial. People in this crowd probably don't need that tutorial, but if you know people who are getting started with DASK, uh, you might want to go there. There's run by Coil that is totally free and most of it is about DASK. So. Uh, again, we all know people who are like Dask curious. That would be a fun way to um, get them more involved. So, sorry, Natty, and uh, your thing. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. It seems like either it's still too early or uh, folks are like quite quiet today. So, uh, I think like we're gonna call it a wrap. And I see like Jacob already shared a link. It might be worth probably sharing it in social and um, spread it out. Uh, again, if folks want to give a talk in, in the future, uh, go and hop in on the DAS community issues that are about DAS demo day. And if you know someone that can give a demo, also send it, send it that way. Um, again, thanks for coming. And I'll see you all yeah. next month. Thanks, everyone. See you. Thanks, Nanny. Thanks. Thanks.